that way I can give you your grade more easily. But, you know, leaving it to me to dig around and look. If there are three team members, I go in three accounts looking for files, that's not good. It's a waste of time. Plus, what happens, I find files and they go, okay, there they are, good. And I grade them, and maybe that's not what you want to grade. So, make sure that you put that on the front. If you have changed your file parser in any substantial way, include a printout of it. The other things that you have already submitted, you need not resubmit. Understand there's no driver this time. You put the main method in your macro PT class. Does everybody know how this works? But, so you have a class definition. And in your CPP file, you have something like macro PP, macro PP, string S. So this is the file you're going to open and process. This is your constructor. And then main So the main method, all you do is create an instance of your macro preprocessor passing in the name of the file. Now, of course, you want more here. Check to see if argc is not equal to 2. Then what do you do? If argc here is not equal to 2, what do you do? Do you throw an exception? No. Heavens no. Not in the main method. Why? Who's going to catch it? Nobody. Nobody. So see out some helpful error message. Usage, macro PP, file name, something like that. Or please supply the file to process, something like that, right? I didn't include that here. It's just the basic mechanism I wanted to show you. <coughs> Questions about this, anyone? Now you know how to open the file. You've got the file parser. So, okay, some other issues that have come up and some questions that I have seen. So what does this process look like? Okay, so you have a source code. Let's call it P1.S. This is your source code file. It's got stuff in it bunch of comments. And then we have and in, in blue and then a file name here, which is a full path on Edoras. And there may be two of those and then we have some setup stuff and then we will have Mac. Sort more lines of code in M. And then some code to print out results, storage declarations, and so on. Okay. What do you do here? Pound sign M include. Do you have to do anything with it? Yes, the answer is yes, you must. You open that file and you insert the contents of that file right here. 
So you do not want to pass this through to the assembler. The assembler doesn't understand what a pound sign M include is. So you remove this instruction. You take it out of the output. It is gone because it can't be assembled. So it is replaced by the contents of this file. So it's as if you take the contents of that file, wipe that out, and stuff them right there. You guys with me? So there's a reason for this. Assembly language programs tend to have a lot of macros. And they can be declared in the same file, or they can be declared in an external file. So the IO max file has, I don't know, 20 macros in it, maybe? There's a bunch of them. Well, what do you do? You're going to read and process those. There's no limit to how many files you're going to process. Now, of course, the computer doesn't care whether there's one or there's a hundred. It's the same process, so that doesn't make this more daunting a challenge. So there are typically two M include statements here. You're going to replace them both. You don't leave the M include in there. It's gone, and in its place is the contents of that file. Well, what processing do you need to do? Nothing. Nothing. So what do you do? You find an M include. You stop. You go and open the file name, and those are the lines you're reading and parsing until you're done, and then you go back and continue on here. You with me? Is that what I understand? This is not hard. This is not hard. You've got the file parser class, so you can easily do this. So, you might start out with a file that had 20 lines of code in it, and after you have done this, now it's got 300 lines of code in it, and then you process it. But this is part of scooping up or reading the file in. So you're going to use your file parser, of course, you need that. But you're going to scoop this in, and at the end of this process, you have some kind of data structure, presumably a vector. Is that what you have, a vector? Okay, so it's got all of this in it, plus these guys. It's got all of the code, all right? So maybe you have this is inserted from there. So you've got it all processed in your vector in order, which is pretty straightforward and easy to do. Then you're going to go through and then process it for the macro definitions. So you start with line zero in your vector that holds all this stuff, and you process it. And what do you do? The logic is you go through until you find the word macro in an opcode field. Once you find that, what do you do? You remove it all. So this part of the code will be removed. You put anything in its place. Nothing. It just disappears. That's what you want. Now you're going to output, finally, so this is in memory. This is your vector in memory that you're going to work on. You go through and you yank out all of these and you have outputs of two forms. The first thing, to screen, print the definition of all the macros. Print them all. This is easy. You're going to have an additional data structure now where you have all of these guys. Print them out so that I can see that you're pulling them out correctly. That goes to screen. And then, two, to disk. If you started with P1.S, it turns into P1.SE, or expanded. Now then, we're not expanding in this project, so what's going to be in this file? P1.SE precisely. What's going to be in that file? 
Yes? All the, everything is set to any macros and then that includes? Yes. Any macro definitions and M includes are yanked out and the rest of the file goes as it is. But it's as if somebody came along. Now what about macro invocations? We're going to have sort a r r outside 10, let's say. What happens to this? This is a macro invocation. Sort array outside 10. What happens to that? It means No, nothing. Don't do anything to it. Nothing. It's going to go over here. Now you're right, uh, Trevor, you're right. It's going to get commented out with your last project. That is, this has no expansion in it. What we're doing is we're setting the framework here, the output in the file, all of that, so that when you do the expansion, this is already in place and it will be easier. Questions? Yes. So on the on the example on the website, it changed the dash one or slash one and all that stuff. Are you doing that this time? You're not doing that this time. It's fine. You copy those bad boys exactly as they are and store them. The expansion will happen in the next phase, your last project. So what you will do is you will find a macro indication like this, and then you will comment it out, and in its place you will insert the body of the macro that you have saved in memory, and you do substitution. Backslash one, backslash two, you're going to do the backslash at thing for the labels, and so on. But the expansion phase is really fairly easy. It's simply find and replace. Find all of the backslash ones and replace them with this. Find all of the backslash twos and replace them with this. All of the backslash ats replace with the invocation counter. So it's actually a fairly simple thing to do. Look at the string methods. There are replace, slice, different methods you can use. And that makes it pretty easy. But you're not doing that now. Mm -hmm. You're just scooping it up now. And the hard part here is organizing the data structures. Figuring out how you're going to organize this. I mean, it's easy to say, OK, I've got a def tab. And this is a macro definition. So my def tab might be a table, or it might be a vector. Um, and you can look at different possibilities, but what if you have 22 macros? Oh dear. What are you going to do? Yes. So I guess you can have uh, just numeric depth tabs, so the first macro be depth tab. Well, that's what I'm talking about, organizing this information. So suppose you have a table, call it name tab. And in this name tab, you have key value pairs. That's what a table is. So the key might be sort. And the value might be a vector. Or it might be a struct. I want you to think about this. What are the pieces of information that go with each macro that have to be stored? The parameters, the parameters, the definition of the macro. By the parameters, I mean backslash one, what is it? Backslash two, what is it? Okay, so when you expand that macro, you're going to do the substitution. And understand that if the macro is called twice, the parameters might be different. The parameters might be different. So when you get at runtime a macro 
request for macro expansion, then you're going to want to pass the parameters into that table. But can you do these parameters when you're just doing the definitions? Well, no, you don't know what they are. But you know how many they are. So, for instance, if we have this sort and it takes, I don't know, three parameters, What if you have a backslash four? Is that an error? Sure. Yes. So think about how you're going to organize this information. You have a set of parameters that's unique for each invocation of the macro. You don't know these until the expansion phase, but you need the ability to deal with them. Def tab, that's the definition of a particular macro. This is the lines. So an easy way to store that might be in a vector of structs. So my question is, what data structure did you use in project one? If you did a vector of structs, then do a vector of structs here. It's the same idea. It will be easier to translate between the two. So name tab. Well, maybe you have a sort. It's the name. And then over here, you have some data structure. Is there a way that you can contain all of the information you need about one macro and say, oh, I don't know, a struct? Can we have a struct that has the following members? And invocation counter then maybe a vector def add maybe a vector or another map simple map param add Okay, so now you have this, which is a struct that's got different pieces in it that are complex. Can you do this? Sure you can. Okay, the key is sort and the value is a reference to this. Did that work? So I want you guys to think about how you're going to organize this information in the goal here. The goal here is when you do the expansion, it's easy, easy. There are ways you can do this that would be extraordinarily difficult. And there are ways you can do it that would be easy. You need to know that you're going to have different parameters for each invocation. Are you going to have different definition table for every invocation? No, you start with the same one. There's only one definition table. That's fixed. The invocation counter is going to change. So what changes? At runtime. At runtime, by that I mean expansion time when the macro preprocessor is running as opposed to rewriting. Runtime is when you're doing the expansion phase. What changes? Does this change? No, it's the same. Does this? Yes. What about your parameter table? Yes. So you'll need to update those structures. For each invocation. But you don't need just one invocation counter, you need one for every macro. So if you have one structure that holds all of those pieces, it's easier. And how many macros are there? I think there are maybe 15 or 20 in the IOMax.s file. So we have a total of maybe 20 to 30 macros in this system that we're using in this class. Your coach had handled them all adroitly, no problems. Questions? Yes? Is it clarified that it includes when you open the file also checking the parameters by definition as well? Yes. So here's how I think it goes. Here's how I think it goes. You start on your P1, 
and you're going to load this thing into a vector data structure, and you're going to parse each line one line at a time, of course. Where you have this M include file name, suppose we have this in the p1.s file. Here I have A, B, C, D, E, M. Three lines, one, two, three, bang, bang, bang. Now inside a file name is X, Y, Z. So once you have finished with your file parser, once you've read the thing in, you now have A, B, C, X, Y, Z. That clear? And some of you seem to think this is an awful thing. It really isn't. You're reading this file. You've got a file handle. You got an image. What do you do? So you stop. You open a new file, this one, and you begin reading it. Well, you know what index you're on. You keep reading out of this file when you tell you're done with it. And when you're done with it, EOF. Go back to the other file handle and keep going. You with me? It's not awful. Yes. So when you're opening the file, do you use the file parser? Or do you just use, use the file parser, sure. And what you can do, of course, is you can make a new data structure if you want to. I and mean, then you could scoop this up and mark where it goes, but it seems easier to just change from one file handle to the other because the reading in is just the same. The reading in is just the same, so you've got this one data structure that holds all of it, so you switch between the two files. While not EOF, get the second file. Hit the EOF, you don't stop, you go back to the other file handle and keep going. Now, I don't want to send you into a spin, but is it possible that that file name includes another M include? Yes. Yes, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, typically they do not, but it's possible. Do you have to handle that? If you handle only this single case, I will be happy with it. But yes, there could be another M include. How would you handle it? unlimited possibilities like that, recursively. Everybody's scared of recursion, my goodness. And you shouldn't be. I mean, it's like you have read a file, you hit something, you do read a file. You hit something, you do read a file, you come back, you come back, you come back. It's not terrible. But what I'm telling you is you don't have to handle that case here. So when I test your program, there will be no M includes and M included files. <laughs> and I want you to be able to process and do the replacement for the macros. So some simplification is fine. Yes. Also, if you read the text, which I hope you have, there's this mention about the fact that you could have de definitions of macros inside of macros. You know, you start, label, macro, instruction, instruction, label, macro. So you have nested macro definitions. Now, I have written many macros over the years, but I have never done a nested macro definition. So I see no reason to deal with that. In, in real terms, I've never had to do it, and I have written a bunch of assembly code over the years, as you guys might imagine. Um, you know, I had this huge project, which was actually emulating the floating point instructions with integer instructions, and they're all macros. There's a whole set of them. F add, F subtract, multiply, divide, power function, F compare, because you can't use integer instructions to compare floating point numbers. So there's a whole suite of those instructions. I've done a lot of programming with macros over the years. I have never needed to define a macro inside a macro definition. So I don't think that it is an unreasonable thing. I think the goal of the department chairman writing that text would be as complete as possible, but it's confusing. 
So there is no definition inside of a definition. Now, when we get to expansion, of course, that's a different story. Could you have recursive expansion? And the answer is yes, you can. So you just call the function when you find it. And don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. At any rate, this piece first. And it's not as hard as some of you want to think it is. So, uh, questions, anyone? Yes. When we were writing the file, is there a specific format you wanted to write? The SE file? The SE file, you should separate the labels, the opcodes, the operands. Um, <clears throat> note, too, that all you have to work with is get token. You, you only have get token to work with to access those data structures that you have stored. Well, this is by design. We don't want you accessing the raw data structure. Um, how it's formatted is up to you. What I want to see is that you have. For the macro in our expansions, and you never want comments there. You never want the expanded comments. It doesn't make any sense. The person looking at the comments didn't write that code, so it's not helpful for any rhyme or reason. Therefore, when you read the macro definitions, you may discard the comments if you want to, because we're not going to do anything with them. And again, this is mentioned in the book, why would you? So for those of you that took, say, 237 with me, there's a macro called line out that prints to the screen. Well, it takes a lot of instructions to do that. And it's messy. Uh, we do we, we include those macros because making the students write instructions in assembler to display characters on the screen is too much. So they're written as a macro, but there are comments in that. Well, what were the comments about line out intended for? Should someone want to come along 10 years later and modify the code, they want to know what's going on. They can track the flow of it. But the programmer that just calls it, line out some string, do they really want to see all the comments that go with that line out macro? No, they don't. So we're going to get rid of the comments here when you define the macros, throw them out. And you can just ignore them if you have your structure with four columns, that last column. Just don't do anything. No big deal. So the actual format of the output is not as important as what's in it. The M include is gone. The macro definitions are gone. Everything else is there. Someone else had a question. Are there any changes made to the .s file? Is it just the .s file? No changes should ever be made to the .s file. I think you can understand. You're working on your program, and the compiler changed your source code. Oh, gee, that wouldn't be cool. No, not cool. Right? So you're going to change that, the .sc file. And when you have the expansion, that's going to go in the .sc file. But again, we're calling it .se because we're laying the groundwork here. You're going to add the expansion phase of it in Program 3 and use that same file. Yes? So uh, when we're getting the macro contained in, uh, inside that, are we also putting in macro well, you don't really need macro and end in. You have the name, and then it's the instructions within the body of it. If you include the macro label and the end in, you will have to get over it. You'll have to you know, ignore it when you do the expansion. Other questions? Yes? How do you go about adding the key to your S? Because my teammates and I recently spent a lot of money. Oh, well, you have a string and you concatenate it, so you just add an eon. It's not hard part. How do you concatenate strings? You can use the plots. So it's concatenation is really fairly straightforward. Yes? Uh, when we're looking for the macro and the nm, um, it says that it's uh, case sensitive. Do we have to look for both of them, upper and lower case? The existing macro preprocessor is partially case sensitive, which is ridiculous. 
<laughs> it's ridiculous. It takes all caps or all lowercase. Um, and the capitalization of macro names has to match, but the assembler is not case sensitive. So it's a ridiculous situation. I can tell you that I will use uh, all lowercase in testing your stuff. I don't care about it because I wanted to follow the follow the specs of the existing one, and it's not consistent, so let's not go there. I'm just going to use lowercase to test your stuff. If you uh, don't uppercase or lowercase, that's fine. What you can do is just ignore the case and take the symbol the way it is. So if I do in it I O capital I capital O, and it's always exactly that. You don't have to take any special precautions, it will always match. But I will test your stuff only with lowercase letters. Yes? So is the name of the macro a label? It is not. It's a macro name. They typically don't have colons, but labels should have a colon. So then our files Well, then you, mean, you need to deal with that. But the way you handle it, um, the way you handle it is up to you. One of the things I warned you about early on was you would have to make changes to your existing code. And that's the case here. Um, but a label in a program is an address or a value inside the assembly language program, but a macro name has no value. That is to say, does it have an address? No, it's pulled out, it's gone. So it is a key in a lookup table where you have everything regarding that macro, but that's not part of the assembly language program. So it really isn't a label. It's in the label field, but it isn't a label. It's a macro name, it's a different animal. So what you can do is just go ahead, if you find the keyword macro, then you go ahead and stop, and you're not using your general rules that you have for everything else. You take what would be the label and insert it in that position without testing it. It's a special case you found macro in an opcode field. So rather than changing so that you allow labels without code, you can just do that. Other questions? No questions? Kenny? Is it, um, when we take out the end of the file, name back to the little line, do you want that print on screen as well? Just, I, I'm sorry, I didn't follow. Uh, on screen, when we have the macros on screen, right? Do you also want the, the little line to come out? And oh, no, that's just gone. That's just disappears. Eat it. Destroy it. It's history. I just want to see the macro definitions. Now if there are other things in that file, of course they will go to the disk. And there are. There's some things in those files that are not macros. There's certain constants that are declared, for instance, at the top of the IO max file. Uh, there are constants that are used to populate the vector jump table, which you don't need to worry about. But just know that there are instructions and things at the top of that file that are not part of the macro definitions. So they will be passed on to the disk file, and I will expect to see them there. But when they go to screen, only the macros. I should see label macro end m, label macro end m, label macro end m. That's what goes to screen. So the other things in that file that may or may not be related in any way go past, they pass untouched into the output file. Other questions? It sounds like some of you are going to have a busy weekend. <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. So I've allocated this time so you guys can meet with your groups and talk about, strategize. The exactly what you guys are going to do is up to you. Maybe it's about planning. I would talk first about how to organize the data. How are you going to do this? 
Um, make plans with your team to who's going to do what piece and how do you meet up to pull all this together. It's really important. I've been super lenient about Project 1. For Project 2, I will be more demanding. I want it right and I want it on time. You may, of course, turn it in late, but there will be a 5% per day penalty for late projects. If I throw away points. So I really want you guys to pull it together and get this thing right. So I'm giving you this time, and I will be right here. Answer any questions you have. Come up and talk to me. And see if you can't get a good handle on how to get this completed and turned in for Monday. So I'm going to stop there and turn you, to let you guys have the rest of the time. Again, I'm going to be right here if you have questions.